question? Okay, today we're going to do the U2 R3 story once over with feeling and uh, get the ideas that are really key to making this work and then show some examples uh, that uh, this, I think will cement the idea, the theoretical uh, nomenclature, but also uh, see what a uh, um, what can be done uh, with this besides uh, the uh, uh, basic classical mechanics. There's a whole bunch of, of things that are sort of hidden in this. Now, um, I want to make it very clear uh, what the uh, big omega, uppercase omega, that's the angular velocity in a sense of, the, um, of the crank that's turning a uh, spin vector, this uh, guy right here. So here's a dot product, an action dot product that we uh, notice in our Poincaré invariant, right? The uh, Lagrangian being equal to uh, uh, momentum p dot velocity v, say, and then minus the Hamiltonian. Okay, that just that that uh, product of a uh, velocity and a momentum is an important thing. It's part of the phase very obviously your exponential of that times time. It's the uh, coefficient of time. So th that, that's one thing to uh, notice. Uh, and then also I want to make uh, very clear uh, in the very beginning of this, uh, it's called a review, but we're going to be getting uh, some new look at things here. I want to make it very clear uh, that the alpha, beta, gamma, polar angles of this are one thing, and then the italic phi, italic theta, and then uppercase theta uh, angles of the omega or the rotation of vector, the big theta vector, uh, is another, and we need to relate those to make this, uh, this formalism uh, really work. So that's taking you into an area that you probably won't see in the literature except in our papers. So I'm just warning you of that. That is our specialty here. And uh, also, as we get to put all of that together, then it will uh, make sense, uh, some of the animations that we'll show. But there's some interesting things I also want to talk about, and that is um, the uh, properties of the shall we say, the um, numerical properties of the frequencies with respect to each other. We're interested in uh, not just their differences, but also their ratios, whether they're rational or not. Okay, so that's, that sort of sums up what we're going to uh, uh, be, be absolutely sure we get to today. Uh, then some of the fancy stuff that involves uh, Dirac points, you've heard that, well, it's, it's, it has old names avoided crossing, avoided symmetry crossings is the other name. Wigner thought of this. This is um, uh, really uh, before Dirac. And um, then uh, a little bit more about ellipsometry, just that if you, you're going to run into polarization almost for sure in almost anything in, in um, solid state physics or in molecular physics or atomic physics, uh, even in high energy physics now it turns out. So it's worth uh, uh, seeing uh, what is on the horizon. Okay, so uh, let's take a look here uh, at these uh, two guys again. Uh, there's two ways uh, uh, to describe uh, states and operators. Um, the Euler angles are usually touted as uh, parameters of a rotation, but um, we make the point here that they're the coordinates of a, that's a classical mechanic thing, 
uh, they are the coordinates of a rigid body uh, in uh, m most contexts. But here, they're the coordinates of a spin vector and its phase. And uh, we've uh, talked about it a little bit already. We're going to burrow into that uh, in some depth. Now, it's unfortunate that everybody in every laboratory doesn't have one of these things. Uh, as I said, there are two I know of in the world. And one of them is in a closet in, the, in Jilla. They used to keep it out in the library that somebody broke something. Uh, the um, thing that uh, is going to happen here uh, at some point is we'll have a um, virtual reality uh, U3 machine that you can play, that you can play with. But that's still a little ways out. We're just uh, uh, nibbling at that uh, new technology at this point. So let's remember that um, the order with which you apply all or Euler angles is alphabetical. Now that is, you start with an original spin up, and well, now I'm thinking of this sphere here, but one that has a vector. It's an almost obscene picture, but eventually we're going to put the vector inside there with lucite so that uh, uh, we can describe it maybe with, uh, a little easy, more easily. But anyway, you start with spin up, and then you access all the other possible states uh, in this alpha, beta, gamma coordinate system uh, by uh, doing uh, some rotation of that spin vector. In this case, it's a very special ordering in which you do uh, alpha, beta, gamma. That's alphabetical order, but you do the end of the alphabet first to set the phase angle uh, on that uh, 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 dial. In other words, to set the angle that's at the bottom of this uh, 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 object right here. This is the guy that has to be set first. The gamma dial has to get set first uh, from somebody outside uh, of the uh, uh, world here. And then, once you've set that thing, then uh, that was done by a Z crank, you use the Y uh, operator uh, to turn it to some angle beta. That's going on right here in the second step. This is the first, that's the second. The third one, finally, Finally, when you got that all set, then you set the dial at the very bottom here, which is the azimuthal or polar angle of the uh, spin vector. Alpha uh, serves the role of what you would call f a phi and polar coordinates. Beta rhymes with the theta in uh, ordinary uh, polar coordinates. So that's the setup. Now, it, it, uh, it gives you uh, here and I'm applying this to a spin-up vector of some amplitude. I'm specifying that if you're going to be doing classical uh, applications of this, that's the fourth parameter. There are three parameters, alpha, beta, gamma, and then there's an amplitude. So it's really a four-dimensional thing here, uh, uh, in four real dimensions. And putting these uh, three matrices together gives this, but we only care about the first column of this thing, if that's the us, uh, the state that we're uh, going to be working uh, with. So when I apply uh, that operator, I get this uh, state here, which has a beta that is the population angle. That's uh, uh, whether you're, uh, you spin up, is the, if your uh, beta is zero, you're, you're very close to spin up. When beta turns to pi uh, over two, or, I'm sorry, uh, pi, then this one uh, would be, the, that would be an inverted population uh, if you're talking about a state of an atom being interrogated in a laser experiment. Then the uh, alpha angle, that's called the coherence. That's actually the phase angle of a classical distribution. Uh, that's the classical phase of the oscillator that uh, is made out of the uh, two-level system. So we write that as a real part plus an imaginary part. The imaginary part here, P, means the momentum of the little two-dimensional oscillator in the x direction of the oscillator. We don't call it x because we're using that uh, for the uh, spin coordinates uh, along with y and z. But uh, number one and number two are our spin up and spin down axes if we're thinking of, of spin the usual way. So there are the four variables uh, that you, the, the system is interested in. 
Uh, and of course, we're using these other variables to find out what uh, state the thing is. So the general state, general spin state, is defined by an Euler rotation operator in that fashion. Now I should point out before we go too far that there are at least three very distinct ways to handle two-state systems, and uh, different authors do various uh, pickings of of these three. The one that we're uh, really uh, um, interested in, probably the oldest one, is the geometry of an ellipse. Uh, how fat is the ellipse? Uh, what orientation does it have? Uh, various things like that are going to be um, characterized by angles, and we'll see the geometry of that uh, um, much, much later in this lecture. The, the key, the heart of this uh, description, are you know, the four dimensions here of the phase. Real, that's x1. Imaginary, that's p1 for this uh, component, and then uh, x1 and x, uh, p2 uh, for the uh, other. So there are the two phasers that describe those two dimensions of the two-dimensional oscillator. And that's, that's the most complete one because it has all four dimensions. This one kind of is leaving something out. And so really is this one right here. This is called the density matrix description because what we're really making uh, here are components that are uh, star products of the components or the amplitudes uh, that we think. But a better way to, s to s display it is what we uh, talked about at the very end of the last lecture, and that is the amplitude star 1 and 2, that's the x1 plus p1 and the x2 plus p2, now uh, as indicated in the very first equation in the upper uh, right hand corner there. Uh, th that star, so I turn the i to minus i on that one, and then just exactly what's written up there uh, for this. So there's the kit, there's the bra that makes an outer, uh, I should say, a matrix element of the sigma A operator. That's the asymmetry operator. Okay, so this is the number that you get out of this thing, the, the A component, um, that's the Z component in Pauli's language. Uh, the asymmetric uh, component is uh, indicating, uh, in a way, we'll see uh, in our animations, the asymmetry uh, with respect to the uh, states 1 and 2. The balance operator uh, gets very large when you're in, uh, more symmetric, either on the 45 degree or the minus 45 degree, 135 degree uh, uh, plane of oscillation, and that, that, like, that will get large when you're uh, uh, doing that. And then, if you've got something that isn't just standing still, either on the x and y axis or in between those two, uh, this one is the one that takes you between them. This is the one that actually has a, a wave that's moving, a wave that carries current. Uh, 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 and as I pointed out to you, uh, it has chirality then, either right or left, in varying amounts, and that number determines that right there. So. Uh, when you uh, look at uh, actually working these out, you discover in terms of the coordinates and momentum of the two-dimensional oscillator uh, 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 some um, different variables here uh, that uh, sometimes are constant, and that's of course uh, what they're good for, is different symmetries. In this case, you've got the energy of the first oscillator minus the energy of that one right there. So that's kind of for quantum mechanics, it's going to be your population. How, how, uh, how inverted are you? How minus are you if you're trying to invert the population? Uh, this one right here is just measuring this, this weird kind of balance or symmetry, uh, and it's a product of both the coordinate and the momentum components. Um, and remember, these are real numbers. And then uh, finally, down here, the one that uh, measures the chirality is the angular momentum if you were imagining a particle in a two dimensional oscillator. Okay, so I'm trying to fill in the physics here uh, to match with the mathematics. And at first, this looks like a fairly complicated bunch of formulas uh, for these things. But then you, uh, of course, are working in the half angle. If you take it to the full angle, you simply have the Cartesian polar representation here with an azimuthal angle alpha. Now, we, we have this in the, the order A, B, C. That's Z, this one, you recognize as Z, right? 
and then the B is the X, you recognize that is the X with the sine of the polar, and then cosine of alpha, and finally Y, this crazy guy down here that does all the kerning and chirality and centrifugal and Coriolis and everything that begins with C, uh, and also it's complex, uh, that uh, is our uh, third. All of this, real, these are things that would help if you were doing density matrices, which is at the end of this lecture, but we will not cover that. I'm leaving it there for completeness. So there's a spin vector with its three co uh, whole, uh, Cartesian coordinates marked with these values. Okay, is that uh, pretty well covered? The Euler angles application, in, uh, as best I can. Uh, at this point. Now this is lecture 22, 70, 76. Uh, if you want to go back over that, uh, please do. But one of the things that I want to make clear is that for uh, ellipsometry, we're going to have angles that describe the ellipse that are related to the Euler angles. Now every angle on this side of the thing, and this is going to be the complex spin space, okay, that the actual trajectory of the oscillator lives in, and I draw a trajectory uh, of just the position, and there's another one that goes with the velocity, as we've seen, uh, but that's tied into the complex variables very nicely. Uh, we're going to have uh, various angles. One of them, the new angle right here, uh, that is the actual polar angle uh, of the, um, let's see if I've got that uh, right here. Um, the polar angle of the, of the ellipse New is two new over here. Every angle over here gets doubled over here in the uh, real three-dimensional density operator space. If you if you uh, use the old the, the um, quantum mechanical jargon that goes with this, but in any case, this spin vector here you see uh, comes up uh, toward the c-axis or the minus c-axis uh, whenever the ellipse opens up from plane polarization. And uh, the angle that describes, uh, you know, where where that uh, uh, ellipse is is also uh, very important. The two phi. It's a little hard to see on on these diagrams, but you you see it right here. Phi equal 30 degrees here would make it two phi of 60 degrees uh, in this plane. So the AB plane is the thing that's keeping track of where the ellipses axes are. That's just one example of uh, how to use Euler angles in a very fluid way, which I'll try to explain if we get time later on. It's a big section in this lecture about that. Now you should notice that we've lost an angle here in this. Density operators have taken this complex absolute values product, so the angle gamma, which is the overall phase of the uh, of the two-dimensional object, that's this thing, it's sitting here on the outside waiting to be lopped off if I look at uh, A star A of any of the components. That's gone. So there's no gamma here, but we're keeping it with this machine. Remember, that dial is still there inside the a base of this spin vector, keeping track of the overall phase. And for the aliens that live on that globe, that's their azimuth angle. Okay? There's two sides to this group theory, and that's a really important thing. This goes back to Archimedes. Give me a place to stand, I move the world, right? Every transformation has a place to stand, and then somewhere you go. A duality is really important in uh, everything we uh, do here. So the basic idea is that all of these ellipses that you can possibly make um, and here I'm just showing it as alpha over 2 is that uh, as this little angle of the ellipse. And then there's an angle psi uh, uh, that uh, determines the um, shape of the ellipse. It's one way to do it. But there's so many other ways to do it that are uh, depend on what experiments you're doing. So we're going to be playing with uh, uh, both sides of this. We'll have all of this stuff going on in this complete description space, which is complex. But then there's this one, which is real. And it will just have every ellipse at any moment described by a point on the sphere, the S vector. Now, we've got to talk more about the omega vector, which is actually driving this thing. So the Hamiltonian has an uh, angular momentum 
associated, or I should say angular velocity, associated with its crank, the omega vector here, as its polar coordinates, and we've got to uh, relate those. That's uh, what the dynamics is all about. Okay, I'm going to keep these uh, tracking each other as most as, as most we can. So, um, any questions about uh, what is here uh, at this particular time? We obviously have a lot to say about it yet, but um, there's the complex stuff up there. That's a complex spinner space with all of its coordinates of Al o Euler type exhibited. Uh, here is the real world, so to speak. A real three-dimensional world. Every a quantity down here is real. Much simpler than what's up there. It's interesting to be able to describe something as complicated as an oriented ellipse, a single point. Okay. All right. Well, here are the machines that do it. And depending on which of these uh, slides is clearest, that one uh, is over-modulated, so it's a little bit of a, an annoyance, and I don't think it helps uh, to reduce the intensity here. It just doesn't do anything uh, on this uh, uh, um, screen. It, it does make it better over here, but let's just leave it the way it is so I can see it. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> okay. So. Here written on the machine are uh, all of the angles that have the uh, blue type, that is, uh, the <clears throat> azimuthal angle of the crank is measured here uh, off of the uh, x-axis, okay, so this is a big angle right there to the crank, okay, who then has a polar angle measured as usual off of the zenith, the z-axis, uh, if you were using the Pauli notation for this weird object. And then there's that third angle, which is the actual rotation angle. And that's going to be moving the spin vector that sticks out of the z-bar axis, that's the body z-axis that's perpendicular to the gamma dial. Um, it's going to be moving that around, plus uh, rotating the dial, and that rotation of dial is mostly what would be called the Berry angle. Anybody familiar with that uh, will be happy to hear that. And then here's the azimuthal dial and the beta dial. The beta rhymes with theta. The alpha is the azimuth. Okay, uh, those are the Euler angles right here. So we've got to relate the angles uh, due uh, to cranking, or the angles that describe the crank's uh, location, uh, and the, um, well, the proper name for this is Darbo angles, I think. Um, there is a polar coordinate or relationship there of the three x, y, and z components, and we're going to use x, y, and z for a little while now instead of a, instead of uh, a b, c, and a. Same with the spin vector. Okay, so here are the Euler angles. Here are the polar angles of the uh, crank vector. So here's our spin vector angular momentum. Here's our angular velocity uh, vector, uh, rotational angular velocity uh, vector. Okay. So, uh, what we're going to be doing is making a relationship so that I can use the alpha, beta, and gamma as operator angles too. Now, let's say a little word about Mr. Darbo or Darbo or however you would pronounce that, is a geometer of some fame. Differential geometry owes a lot to him. If you take an advanced calculus course, there is a Darbo vector. It's really the angular velocity vector. And he's the one that probably put the omega uh, on that particular physical quantity. But you can, you can say, if I start uh, with this ball at some position and just go, you know, with my eyes closed, spin the thing up and stop, you would maybe say that every point on that sphere is in a different position than it was originally before I started. When I call, called off, that's my starting point, and then I did the and stop. You might think that all of those points are in a different position, but that's not true, is it? That's what we've got to reckon with. This is Darbu's basic idea. There are two points on that sphere that are in the same place they were 
the axis, the axis points. And they're opposite each other. And that's the axis of rotation with which I would have gotten to all those rotations done in one move. That's what Darbu does for you. It gets you there the most direct way. Okay? So that's what we have to solve. We have to uh, find out how are the alpha, beta, and gamma related to the polar angles over here. So that is, uh, and let's just remind ourselves what we're doing by leaving it on that screen. And now we're going to work out uh, what, those, what those relations are. So that, that's the, the thing. But first, let's, let's pause and just remember, for a physicist or a mathematician, what are alpha, beta, and gammas better at? Uh, certainly for classical mechanics, they make much better coordinates. It's really obvious to me where that thing is when you give me my Euler angles, right? This has a certain value for those angles too, but that is really hard to see, and that's what we're about to figure out. Okay. What these things excel at is parameters of the group rotation, the rotation group. I can look at just the third com com parameter here and tell you how much you rotated to get there. And then the other two tell me where that axis is. Right? So right off the bat, you want to see how, how, how those uh, different things play different roles more difficultly. Di more difficult or less difficult depending on the situation. So here's our definition for the uh, coordinates. And here's our phase coherence angle for physicists. Here's our population inversion angle beta. Here's our overall phase angle, Barry angle maybe, give somebody some naming rights. Okay. And there's the little spinner that describes this thing. Okay. But we need to uh, be able to say which one of these things got us to this one. That's what we're about to do. Yes. So, are these uh, alpha, beta, and gamma also orthogonal? Are the alpha, beta, gamma. angles beta, gamma, when you say are they orthogonal, it would probably mean is something associated with them orthogonal, right? And the answer is sort of sitting here, and the answer is sort of, right? In the sense that uh, this axis with the gamma on it is always orthogonal to this one, and then that one in turn is orthogonal to this one. So in that sense, very orthogonal. You can find in uh, axis of rotation for all three of them. Like, well, you obviously need all three to, you know, if I freeze any one of those, I'm kind of stuck, right? Like there'd yeah, be okay. where I can be with the uh, alpha, uh, even if I turn this, uh, that's still not much coverage of a sphere, right? So we need all three. But as you can see, their axes are definitely orthogonal. It's a very good question. Now this guy, on the other hand, uh, I can put him anywhere, so he's, he's not going to be orthogonal to those very often. <clears throat> Only in those special cases when we set. Use Euler's recipe. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're just going to take these things apart and find x1. Okay. Now what's really amusing is that x1 is the coefficient of this first operator, which is the unit operator. I put it first this time instead of last. Okay, so th that's kind of neat. And then uh, what I want to do is look at the first coefficient of this uh, guy right here. That's just cosine theta over 2. So we already got an equation for alpha, beta, and gamma in terms of the crank angle. How much I'm cranking. That's this guy up at the top here. And the crank angle theta is going to be, when we have constant Hamiltonians, a constant omega times time. Okay, so remember that. Those two big Greek symbols represent the cranks, uh, position and velocity, respectively. Right? Okay, that's one. We have four. Uh, we got to get four here. We got three to go. Okay? So the next stop is, as it turns out, this one is equal to minus P2. So 
we've got this one and we've got this one with a minus sign out right here. And uh, while we're at it, we take this one off right here. Now notice what I've done here, and we didn't make a big fuss about this when we first talked about these angles. We just had a, a, a theta hat, a unit x, a unit y, and a unit z, uh, called differently, of course. We had b, a c, and a. But there they are uh, with their polar coordinates, and we start to put those uh, into place here. So this is going to be uh, what we're looking at uh, for this guy right here, the second component of the uh, momentum. And then x2, okay, it turns out that that guy, uh, and if you see the little lines here for x2, that's this green dotted line coming out here, that's this one. Okay, and by the same thing, this is the one that we've been looking. Now we've just got one more to go. And those are the four-dimensional polar coordinates. One of them sort of uh, two uh, times two is four, and the other one is uh, three plus one is four. So we've got a sort of fourth odd axis here that just deals with the crank, and then we've got, as long as we hold the crank constant, we've got three things that are polar coordinates of coordinates uh, x, y, and z. So that's the equation we have to solve. We've got to solve that mess there. Okay? Now I'm going to go through this solution really fast, and then we're going to make use of it. Um, but you should come back and uh, take a look at this. And this is something that I would like at some point on, in the problems I gave out to um, you know, make a stab at, at those coordinates. Okay, so here's Euler related to Darboux. If we demand that the uh, operator that defines the state be gotten by a single crank rotation, we're going to have to find out uh, what these equations uh, give us for one in one set in terms of the other. So what I do is I just go through there and look for things that uh, I can uh, uh, say, and that's the, that's the first one to set uh, uh, right, <coughs> right uh, in uh, this thing. And I also look at this one uh, down here, put those two together, I get an equation for alpha plus gamma in terms of uh, theta and the crank angle, turn angle uh, uh, theta. Then I get, by looking again, uh, gamma minus alpha. And then I can write an actual thing without a tangent for alpha minus gamma. So the uh, phi, the azimuth of the crank, is a difference between alpha and gamma. With with a factor two and it's the complement uh, of it, all right? And here's alpha plus gamma, so I can get alpha and gamma separately. We'll do that in a minute. Uh, I then pull out by looking at this thing carefully, and as I say, it just takes a bit of staring to see uh, where these relations come from, but basically by putting those two together and then making use of their difference, I uh, get alpha and gamma in terms of all of gamma. So we got, we're, we're two-thirds of the way in a relationship for alpha, beta, and gamma. We need the beta. And that's a little harder. We have to find in there a relation with sine beta like that. But once we get that, it's, it's, you're, we're home for this side of the equation, alpha, beta, and gamma. It's a little bit more labor to get those three guys in terms of alpha, beta, and gamma. Okay, So the inverse relation. We go back up there and look at a couple of these things with the dotted lines here to give you a clue for that. We already have this one. That was linear, so we just solved that uh, very quickly. But the uh, beta guy takes a little bit of work. Theta and beta fight us all the way. But when we get done, we do have uh, this and this. Now, when you do all of this complicated polar coordinate transformation, um, you really want to check it, right? That's a lot of stuff here, okay? And believe me, I made a couple of sign errors before I got this right. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take Euler angles 50, 60, and 70, and that, there'll be pictures of the machine in that particular state of orientation. And here's what it's telling us, our phi uh, 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 italic theta and big theta, okay? The polar angles and the turn. 
okay? Uh, well, this one comes out to be exactly 80, all right? This one comes out, this uh, theta angle, that's this angle right here, comes out to be uh, a 33 and, uh, and change. And then 128 and same change uh, is how much I would turn in order to get from spin up to a state that has alpha, beta, and gamma of 50, 60, and 70. Well, we still haven't checked it. We've got to put these against each other, okay? And when you do that, the reverse check, getting alpha, beta, gamma back in terms of these guys, okay, blah, 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 let's stick it all in there. And, of course, you're going to find that you don't quite make it, right? And that's because you only have about three-figure accuracy here. This is asking for it and four, right? So that checks it. That, that checks it as, as, as best you could ask for. All right? Okay. Now, um, one of the things um, is to see the sequence of going through these things. And this is just advertising. Well, someday we'll do this in virtual reality. But uh, we, we will take a little bit of time just to go through uh, what's uh, going on here. What I'm doing is I'm immediately setting uh, this thing up with that 33.7, actually 33.69 uh, uh, setting of the uh, uh, dial uh, down here. So we're starting off here at minus 10, 0, 10 uh, with the... Um, the alpha, beta, and gamma. But the dial, the, the, the ball itself is still lined up as far as the coordinates x, y, and z are concerned. Uh, the gamma is a little uh, uh, cocked. And it needs to be because, you see, in order to turn this thing, I have to have the thing free to actually rotate uh, uh, with. And that depends on uh, where I have this thing uh, sitting, you see. I'm starting off with this thing. And uh, here, uh, it's going to be hard for me to rotate. I'm going to have to put this thing opposite uh, wherever this crank base is in order to start this thing on its journey, okay? So if it had been over here on the y-axis, which is where you start, that wouldn't work. I would maybe turn it in there, or I have two choices, uh, turn it there, okay? And then uh, I, I try to secure this thing as best I can and that um, this is very crude. Excuse me while I spit on it. I've got to put some, and I hope I ate some very thick oatmeal this morning so that I can make, really make this vacuum good here, okay? But the idea is I'm going to jam that guy on there as best I can, turn the brass thing there so it's stuck, and then start turning it, okay? And I'm going to go uh, left-handed, uh, I'm sorry, right-handed positive, so this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to be going uh, around with this thing, uh, changing uh, the, all of the uh, alpha, beta, and gamma dials, including beta doesn't look like it's changing much, but it's going to come back down again, you see. And I will have done, with this crank, a 2 pi rotation at this point. Okay? Now, this, that mysterious 2 to 1 is at work here. Okay, when I get down to the end here, I've turned by 300. I only need another 60 uh, to get the next frame here, which is this one right here. So this is the ball back in line with the three-dimensional universe, that real world, right? But look who's here now. The beta dials here was on the other side. You can hardly see it. We're halfway. I gotta go 720 to get to this. Twice 360. Four pi. I've gotta go. Okay? So this machine really shows in grisly detail, you might say, of this two to one business. Now there's a period there where British people, and these were following Dirac, uh, realized there was this two to one with spinners, and um, they worked out ways to uh, show it, and I will uh, show one right here. What they would do was they would partially disrobe to show this. Now, this isn't uh, Mr. Wiener 
uh, doing some dirty dealing, but uh, this is what they did. They took your belt off and did something like this, which didn't explain anything. I guess they just wanted to show you they had a belt or something. But what you really should realize is that you can do this just with, you've got a water bottle. Some of you do, right? You can just hold it, okay, with a little lid. You've got a lid that's pointing, so that'll determine, you know, whether this thing has come back again. But what I'm going to do is without breaking my ankle or, I mean, I'm sorry, my wrist or my uh, elbow or my shoulder joint, I'm going to rotate this thing by 4 pi. Okay? So it's pointing at you now, right? It's pointing at you again, and I'm going to keep rotating it the same direction so that it's back again pointing at you. Okay? That's all they had to do. <laughs> to demonstrate what we're talking about. But then, you're really nice to have a machine that shows you precisely uh, what it is doing. It's also nice to have applications of this that very few people know about. And this is from Scientific American. This cr crazy thing here allows you to get current into something that's in a rotating table without having any brushes which make noise. So this is like the, the guy here. It gets tangled a little bit, just like I was sort of tangled when I was right here, halfway, right? You, uh, uh, but I just keep going, just like any majorette in a high school in the United States does, right? They do this with flaming batons, right? Very quickly. And usually they don't have to go to the doctor afterwards. I, I'm already feeling a little pain here, so... I may leave early, but uh, that is the uh, really application. And if you want to look at something in a rotating table, do it with prisms. You just have to have another set of prisms that goes around half as fast, like this frame does, as the actual rotation. So that's what the gears are here, two to one, down here. So that, that, that's cool, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So when you when this came back, right, so your hand only did a half the rotation. The axis was your elbow, right? So the elbow only did half of a rotation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I didn't have to break it. Okay, so. Yeah. And then I unrotated by half. So that's what really happens as it goes around. And you can see very precisely with this thing where all they are uh, during that uh, rotation. Okay. This, I think is uh, something that every physicist should see this, but some physicists, ah, I don't care, but uh, it is really part of our topology that we live in, so it's really worth a see. Now, as far as uh, the algebra of what we're talking about here, I want to make sure that you know, and we'll do this also very quickly because I want to get to the physics of this uh, motion. Um, a quick way to find eigen solutions for uh, two by two is if you uh, have a Hamiltonian that you know uh, the values of, uh, and this is this is not trivial because we're most of the time dealing with complex numbers which are very laborious to uh, arithmetic. They're they're more than two times the effort. They're more like four or eight times the effort, right? So. Um, you really should be thankful for something that gives you... We, you can use our spectral decomposition, it'll work, but you've got all the uh, complex arithmetic goes with it, and you've got lots of plus and minus things you got to worry about uh, and, and sometimes when you're doing this. Okay? So we're given a Hamiltonian with some values uh, for this. Okay? And I'm <clears throat> just going algebraically here. But the basic idea is that we're going to be looking for uh, the, that magic point in uh, space uh, where the crank lies, you see, this, this thing here. And we kind of already have it. There are the three components. But we have our transformation as well uh, to help us if we get stuck. Okay. But first, the eigenvalues. And this is something I definitely want you to write down on the homework, uh, where you do redo the two-dimensional oscillator using uh, uh, the spinner stuff and, and the A, B, C, and D, omega, and uh, theta and phi and all of that uh, uh, coordinates. So the little diagram I want you to draw is the angular velocity uh, that the uh, crank has going with it. The omega that gets multiplied by time to give the rotation 
assuming that omega is constant throughout uh, a typical rotation like we just did there. Okay, so there'll be an overall omega zero. Okay, it's just a plus d over two that some of the diagonals have. Okay, and then there'll be an ohm, a big omega over two both ways, plus and minus. Those will be the two roots, up and down. Okay, the, the high eigenvalue and the low eigenvalue. Okay, so that's the end of the problem as far as eigenvalues goes. But I want the eigenvectors. You know, I always caution people to, uh, in physics, the uh, information is contained in the eigenvectors. Uh, much more information in general. Here it's the same information because uh, basically it's two by two. So two plus two is the same as two times two. Anyway, uh, it's these relationships right here that let us get this. And th this is a relationship that we could get without uh, doing what we just did with, with the transformation. But that's fine. This is showing you you don't have to know about that transformation uh, to get these things. Because what you're going to do is get the vector uh, root, uh, that you uh, and the crank that you uh, are, are looking for here. So that is the basic idea. So find the eigenvectors, replace the Euler angles, okay, azimuth, alpha, and, and beta of the Euler state by the azimuth and the polar angle of the crank. That's it. But you have to be a little careful about that, okay? So here's the azimuth and polar of the actual H matrix, okay? These are the azimuth angles and polar of the Euler state. We want those to line up. The idea is we want them to line up because, and let me take this thing apart again, <clears throat> because if I had a particular uh, alpha, beta, and gamma, you see, I'd want to put the crank right on the z-axis, I'm just doing it artificially here, I put it right in the center of that, and then when the crank turns, you see, nothing moves. It's a stationary state, you see. The only thing that's going to move, if I did it perfectly, not the beta, not the alpha, but gamma is just going to rotate. That's the phase, right? So that's what an eigenstate does. It just sits there and wiggles its phase. If you're doing density measuring, nothing's happening, right? But there's another one, right? That's orthogonal to it. You, you, you talked about orthogonal. It's 180 degrees orthogonal to it. And this is one I can't really do very elegantly, but that's what it would be. That's the other state. You're done. There's the spin up crank. I put in uh, the, uh, the angles as stated here. You place alpha, beta, or the positions of them with the polar uh, coordinates of the crank. And then I just do it again with an extra pi on the theta. I turn it over. So that's the down crank. That's not the only way to do it, but that is the easiest probably. Does that make sense? Okay. So the, re the remaining slides here, uh, which I'll go ahead and bring this thing up to speed here. The remaining slides here are just doing uh, that real quickly with an actual numerical uh, answer. Okay, so I will do that uh, quickly, and then we'll have time to actually let the uh, simulations go. So I picked this matrix here with you know a complex number where a complex number could be, and then I just remember get the eigenvalues uh, really quickly. So I get eight and ten. That lets me draw a diagram something like that, uh, of the uh, eigenvalues. And remember, the reason we have this one half here is so that that omega, that uppercase omega, is the beat frequency of the two levels. And there is only one frequency that you can directly observe. You can't see what the phases are doing very well, but you can see that. So that's the transition frequency for that two-level system, omega. But we want to know what the, the states are that uh, uh, are hop and bottom, uh, too. So I go ahead and using the eigenvalues, get the eigenvectors with the polar angles, and that's it. Okay. So that's what I'm saying. 
can you write down all the eigen solutions, not just eigenvalues, to the following H matrix in 60 seconds? You see, so if you have any contest, a U2 contest, so that's an example of it. Okay. All right. That, enough of the uh, arithmetic. Let's get a look at what the states look like for various parameters, particularly asymmetric diagonal A-type motion. Okay? A-type motion. Only A and D non-zero. A and or D non-zero. Okay? So basically, it's just a linear combination of the unit operator, sigma zero is the name we've been giving that, and this guy right here, sigma A. Okay? Well, that's sigma Z. Okay? And I've drawn it so A is up, to, so it's in the right position for people that are used to X, Y, and Z. Okay? And now this guy is uh, uh, going to simply, I mean, now that I know uh, that's the rotation axis that's going to be a, a, applying here, H, A, sigma A frame, uh, I know uh, that it's going to be taking any spin vector that's out here in the hinterlands for a ride around the A axis. So we need to uh, get a look at that. But when you come back and look at what it's doing to the two states that, uh, that we work with, this is the uh, crank and spin, those are all real numbers, what is it doing uh, to the actual uh, two, the spin up and spin down states? Well, we're all set to display that because this is a two-dimensional oscillator that's going to be behaving uh, according to whatever uh, uh, happens here with regard to our initial conditions of the spin vector, that's the state, the Stokes state, if you will. S stands for uh, Stokes, not, uh, 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 that's 1867 or so uh, that he uh, starts uh, seeing it. Say. So we're going to just be looking at a beat frequency of whatever I uh, allow for this thing to go, and I'm going to try to make uh, it happen here uh, by uh, hitting this thing uh, off. So let's see. This will be taking us to box it in these settings, hopefully. Something funny happened there. I haven't seen that behavior before. Uh, you can copy and paste that in your browser address window. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Run it on the other screen. Let's see if I can. I, yeah, let's. <laughs> Just that that, that uh, uh, is always a pain when it doesn't uh, do its thing. Well, let's exit out of it first, because that was one of the things, right? Now we can get at it. And that's... Uh, yeah, you, you probably want to go back, so you, it, it, uh, you want to do it. There you go. Now, I can't square up on that. <clears throat> if I sat down, I could do it. Let's see if that starts it. It, it doesn't. Where's your browser at? Uh, it looks like it strobes and goes away. We've got so a... We killed the browser first. Uh, this is a pretty good... Uh, that's the one that's running. You can see it is very confused. Quit it. Quit it. Uh, Chrome, you said that was the greatest thing in the world. I can make it work if you let me sit down, Bill. Um, I mean, all of these work this morning. There See, we it go. works now. There we go. Okay. So this this one, this is showing um, what it does. Um, basically, I've got an omega vector here on the A axis, and using the right hand, okay, that's the direction of, of the uh, spin vector that's making this. Uh, happen. Now if, uh, for example, I start this thing on the x-axis right here, that's all that's going to happen, right? Because I've got a, an eigenvector. I've got an eigenstate. Anything that goes in the x-direction is an eigenstate of this Hamiltonian. Very trivial, right? It's a diagonal matrix, so you would know this. And then uh, the other possibility, you see, is to start the thing off uh, here. Same thing. Okay. Now, 
it helps to erase the path. So you can see there's nothing going on up there, just this, right? It's just going back and forth on the fast axis. And you can see that's the fast, I'm sorry, that's the slow axis, and it is slower. And then the other guy uh, is the fast axis. That's, uh, let's start always at this point. If I go here, then only this one uh, goes, okay? And then everything else, you see, these are the normal modes. They're normal to each other, right? That's the, the reason for that name, okay? Then any other mode that's a linear combination of those two, like uh, this one, well, it's going to do a dance for us. And the structure of that, I need to talk about, depends on the ratio of these. But the already the speed that, with which this thing uh, develops uh, here, that is, that S uh, turning there, uh, is dependent on the difference between the two eigenfrequencies. And these are the two eigenfrequencies uh, right here. Now this one looks like it's irrational, and we need to talk about that, but I want to wait for the B motion to do that. Okay, so that's a simple case, simple as you can get. It, it, just a G motion, motion a, asymmetric diagonal uh, motion. <clears throat> uh, let's go ahead and pause this and see if I can get the same thing going on uh, the next one. So I'm going to come back to here. I'm going to uh, re-engage the um, keynote uh, application and move here. Here's just a picture of it that goes uh, with, with the, uh, um, <clears throat> what we just saw. And then this is going to be uh, where we uh, look at balance type motion. That is motion that's between all x and all y, just exactly halfway between it, uh, which is governed by a Hamiltonian that has off diagonal, no diagonal necessarily, but you can always add it uh, to get the phase up. So that, that's what we're looking at as an operator, okay? And um, <clears throat> by the way, at the very top of these screens in the upper corner is the uh, density matrix that goes with this thing, and it's just a function of, of the spin uh, S Stokes vector, while the Hamiltonian is a similar combination of the uh, crank uh, vector, uh, big omega. It makes the big theta if you multiply it by time. Okay, so we're looking at eigenvectors uh, that are at 45 degrees uh, on this one. And this is in some examples of the old plots that we got before we started putting everything on the web here. But let's see if I can get this guy uh, to uh, respond. And it does so uh, right away. Okay? Now there's a couple of things I want you to notice about this one. And I'm going to take this screen ahead to the, to, to it as well to make the comments about this thing. But, um, as you can see, it's quasi-periodic. The lines are getting a little thicker, but it's hanging to them pretty closely. So if I go ahead on this one uh, to this uh, state we're at uh, right now, and then what I want to show you, uh, and maybe I'll do it on this one, uh, because one of the things I uh, need to do is slow it down. So let me go ahead and get this motion going and slow it the heck down here uh, by uh, bringing this guy to a lower value. Um, this is one time when this is going to work pretty well. If I take this down to one, that's pretty slow right there. Okay. Now I'm going to uh, go ahead and um, pause this thing. I'm going to kick the erase so it starts again with nothing showing, okay? Now what I want you to see is there's a spin vector going around, okay, just past uh, the C, which means I got circular-like motion, but it isn't very circular because we're not so close to that axis.
and then it's going to come through here and proceed to there. Whoops, I reset. I should have done a pause. Let's do it once again. I should have been watching the spin vector. Mm -hmm. So there's the spin vector there, okay? And it, it's a quarter of the way, more than a quarter of the way, more than a uh, halfway about now, okay? Uh, and, and making its circuit. And it's going to be turning from a 2 pi uh, uh, very shortly here. And uh, that's when I want to stop it, pause uh, it. Okay? So I'm going to pause it right there. That's about as close as I can get. And look where it is. This is not home. We started over in the right hand side. This one's pi out of phase. And that's what's going to happen in any two-state system. We saw that when you went with a, a rotation of 2 pi in the, in the spin vector space and took from spin up state to spin, sorry, spin down state to spin up or vice versa, okay, that this, the, the uh, spinner space, you're only halfway, right? When you do finish that rotation, you'll be over here, pi out of phase. This is what it, it, it means. It really means you're pi out of phase with where you were when you started. This guy down at the bottom there is quite almost on the axis. This guy's at a, at a minimum or maximum amplitude. So that, that's one point I want to make very clearly. The other point is, what does it take to get something that's a periodic like that? Just picking random numbers. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. What do you look for? So that, that needs to be discussed. I think that's really uh, quite uh, cool about all of this stuff and all of physics for that matter. So I'll pause this and I will return, hopefully in one move, uh, to the original lecture. And what we're going to do, and that's roughly uh, what we uh, had uh, if we let the thing go, uh, is this. Now, one of the things that these uh, um, programs do that is uh, what I want to talk about now is when I go to the controls and let, let us see the partial fractions, the continued fractions actually, that are represented by the ratio of the frequencies, the eigenfrequencies. So I'm going to resume this guy right here and maybe pick up the speed just a little bit so that it doesn't take forever uh, to go. Uh, to various places. So I've got a pretty healthy uh, thing here. Now, uh, I'd like to um, actually, uh, what I'm seeing here is it's not showing me. Let's go back to the controls here. Hit start instead of resume. Okay. Reset. Hit start. Oh, start. <laughs> you should make it so that it works. It, there we it go. works right there. Okay, um, and let's go ahead and pause after a little while here when we have uh, whatever it is, I'll resume. Okay, I think that's uh, as far as we're going to go. And what you'll notice if you count the number of crossings uh, uh, for uh, these uh, the, the various uh, lines here, okay, We're starting at the bottom there, one, two, three, I'm, I'm just going up the axis here, one, the bottom here, uh, actually, I should be a little careful and not uh, push the button so it goes off again. Um, let's reset this thing. Uh, <clears throat> I should probably just point at this one because it is not going to move if I play with it. But this is very similar to what we're getting here, and let's use it to count uh, what we have. Uh, pause. <clears throat> the number of, of, of crossings uh, on the x-axis versus the number that cross the y-axis. Remember, we've done this game before. Um, here we go, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
9, 10, 11, to count that one. And then going the other way, we go 1, 2, 3, 4, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, that's this guy, 8, this guy, 9, 10, and let's see, 11, that's something weird going on. No, 9 and 11, that's the ratio you have over oh, okay. there. okay, okay. That's, that's what this thing ends with, okay, uh, is 11 to 9, if you let it run the full course. Now, uh, what I want to uh, do, besides showing pi r of h, is discuss continued fraction. If you calculate continued fractions for any number, it's just very uh, an edifying thing to do when you get numbers that, like e and pi and uh, others, check out their uh, approximations. So what I, what I do is take the number, pi, okay, find the integer of it, I mean, plop off the decimal part, that's three. So there's an approximation to pi that, in fact, is in the Bible, okay? So this is where you stop if you're a fundamentalist in Arkansas. Anyway, continuing here, uh, pi equals three, substituted back into an expression like that, that we had for our first uh, n zero, okay, and then go, uh, find the n1. The n1 is the integer of what you get left after you subtract off the n0. So 7.06, the integer of that is 7. Then you use it, 1 plus, uh, I should say pi, is 3 plus 1 seventh, 22 sevenths. That's a pretty good appro approximation. You, you've got three-figure accuracy almost. Okay? Then I do it again. Okay? I uh, take 1 over a, my last n1, subtract that, that's 15, to the integer of that is 15, now I make a partial fraction using that uh, in this position right here, 1 15th. Wow, I'm 3.1415, 9 should be, and it's not good, so it's, it's good, really, really quite accurate, okay? Come back, do it again, 3.141592, well, it should be 6 or 7, and so it's off right there, okay? So that's, you know, something you should have a program for. Mathematica, of course, has it, but uh, you should make your own, all right? Now, here's sort of the opposite. This one uh, approximated very, very quickly. The golden ratio is the worst. Look what it does as I take this thing. Uh, first, I get one. That's not a very good approximation, but okay, we'll take it. We go ahead and get the next one, which is one. Okay, so I go one over one plus one. That's two. Well, okay, maybe it's a little closer, but it's still not 1.618. Okay, and then I go once more again on that thing. I get another one. See, I always get one. And notice the numbers that I'm getting here. Next thing is one three halves, 1.5. Well, it's close to 1.6, I guess. Next stop is 5 thirds, 1.666, okay? Recognize those numbers? They're Mr. Fujinacci's number, okay? 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, 5 plus 3 is 8, right? So this, this is the most irrational number, and it's also the closest to being rational. All we would have taken is for one of these to come out zero. If you get a zero, that's the end of it, it's rational. So this is right on the border of being rational. And you're the most irrational. Okay, so when you go uh, with the uh, thing, if you just let this thing run for a while, you'll see five-fourths as an approximation to 1.22222, this is how happens when we use this particular frequency, so omega 1 over omega 2, okay? The next stop after that is 6 to 5. That's what you're seeing there, if you count the crossings, one side versus the other, okay? And then finally, this one right here shows us that we're, we're, we're at a rational number. This was a rational number. And you can see from the decimals that it is. Right? Then the, the, the um, 
program that does this goes crazy, we'll probably have to figure out a way to keep it uh, from di just writing, now you're at irrational, or something like that. Okay. I mean, <laughs> shows what precision we're using uh, to do this. Okay? Does that make sense? It's kind of a neat thing uh, about uh, these um, oscillators. Okay. Now, C-type motion. This is the one that has the current. And this one, you can visualize uh, the two-for-one uh, rather easily. And I'll do that uh, fairly quickly here just to um, get this uh, off the thing. Let's see if we can get it to once again. Yes, here we go. So if I start off with what I started with before, just uh, a vector out there, uh, you know, on the uh, A axis, okay, it goes for a ride. So this would correspond to, in classical mechanics, a Foucault pendulum. And it'll be true for uh, any sort of, uh, of um, figure, any sort of initial conditions that I uh, apply, um, if I just uh, go ahead and uh, erase the paths and start off, say, here, and give it a little velocity so it's an ellipse, then I get this, okay? So now it's, do it's, it's doing a rotation around the C-axis, right-hand thumb along the C-axis, that's the direction the spin vector goes, okay? And then the orbit that you're making here uh, is a rotating ellipse. And then it's making some pattern, we could check to see what the, uh, the eigenvalues, and this one's interesting because you're actually making a torus uh, as it goes around there, and that uh, torus has a coordinate system that tracks these integers that we're worried about uh, 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 counting. Okay, and uh, the uh, it, it, go ahead and uh, erase the path and maybe make an ellipse that goes the other way. Still going to process in the same direction. Okay, now let's uh, go ahead and pause this, go back. A couple other things I want to go before we uh, uh, finish this uh, to a, a reasonable uh, stop. This is a clean picture of it uh, with that particular one set uh, up there. Um, what I, I would like you to see is what happens if I get all three of these things going. Then my omega vector is going to be in some other uh, location. And my uh, uh, Lissajou pattern uh, will uh, behave accordingly. Now this particular one has c equals zero. So when I make that pattern, I get that kind of rectangle that I got when I did the first uh, A-type thing, but it's rotated. So that, that's one thing that you, you can uh, notice about this right off the bat here. But this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with what we call a Dirac point, or avoided crossing. And here, with just doing A and B, no C, to make it uh, a little simpler. Uh, so this would be um, the kind of oscillator we worked with. If we just had a K matrix and we didn't bother trying to put a, any cyclotron stuff into it, or rotate it, or do anything that's got chirality, one of the things I want you to notice about a two-state uh, matrix of this type is if you do a, a transformation using symmetric anti-symmetric uh, eigenvectors that is going for the B uh, 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 coordinate system, you get a very nice result that is the transformation of A on the diagonal, B off diagonal, just turns into B on the diagonal with a plus and minus sign, just like the A did, and the A off diagonal. Okay, so that, that's kind of cool right there. But what we're talking about is the Hamiltonian associated with the motion of the wave function of ammonia as it uh, tunnels. Uh, ammonia doesn't like to live very long in a state like that or that. It wants to be in the ground state, which is this one, or the excited state, which has a minus sign in here, which is this one. So the, here the phasers are in phase, here they're out of phase. Okay, so 
we've made pictures of the excited state here with the phasers out of phase uh, right there. And then uh, the ground state is right here. Now what happens if you turn on uh, for a system that had just an A-type symmetry, you turn on a little bit of B, well, one of these goes down, the other goes up, and if you go and turn, make the field really, really big so that it pushes, this is a field that's pushing all of the, or, or uh, at least that's what you would think it would do, but if you have to do this slowly, it's called adiabatic um, uh, motion, uh, you, you go and make bigger and bigger field, you polarize this thing by putting all of the uh, charge on one side or the other. But when you apply that field to an excited state, it's just the opposite. You go, I want you to go over there. You go, and it just goes the reverse. So th these are like the contras, you know, they, they fight you. The excited states always fight you. And then you say, okay, okay, I'll, I want you to go over there. So I'm going to put the field this way, and then you get them to go, right? The way you want, say to the right. So th this is a really neat thing. I've skipped discussing this. This just shows why perturbation theory can very often lead you astray. But this is a picture of the entire uh, energy uh, eigenvalue surface uh, for this particular system and any other one uh, like it. And the two hyperbolas are just cross sections of a cone. This is a direct cone. This is what they call. You know, this is what we're all so excited about now when we uh, get graphene graphene bands to cross like that. Uh, that uh, is, is pretty neat. So, um, the rest of this is ellipsometry, and some of it is very beautiful. Here I'm just going ahead and showing you uh, with a very um, uh, irrational uh, trajectory that, that actually displays uh, the torus that is uh, going on in the classical mechanics. And these are the uh, Stokes pictures that are applicable to each one of these. We just look at the C type and the A type. Those are A, B, C uh, types right there. And here's a, These are stereo pictures. You start off with a, a torus here when your uh, um, <coughs> circle is very close to the equator. Um, you, this is also 3D, so if you want to do a stereo, you can really see a four-dimensional sphere, which is called the invariant torus by people living in three dimensions. So you close the opening there. Here is right in, sort of in the middle where you have an opening in both ways. But it isn't really an opening. But finally, it does open up uh, to uh, be perfect, the opening perpendicular to this one. And uh, this is just a torus. It's always the same, but I'm picking different ratios to make different uh, uh, symmetries uh, of uh, the there's an example right there. So we're uh, at the end of our time. It would be nice to explore that a little bit more, but uh, I hope you enjoyed seeing that much of what we call the wonderful world of two-dimensional complex spaces and spinners and all of that. Okay, for one of you, I say happy Thanksgiving. The other two will be back here on Tuesday. The other four will be back here on Tuesday. Uh, well, we'll do some really weird stuff. <laughs> okay. <clears throat>